Good morning, everyone. Um, this is Heather Fleming. I was the lady that sent out the invitations. Can you all hear me okay? Give me a thumbs up or thumbs down or let me know in chat if you can hear me. Awesome. Okay. Uh, what I would like to ask you to do is make sure everybody has their microphones muted. And um, if you can turn off your cameras, that would help us with the bandwidth. We'll keep it at a minimum. And that way we'll be able to hear and see Dr. Butali as well as we possibly can. As well as we possibly can. He will be on here very, very shortly. And I will let him introduce himself and give you a few particulars about himself before he starts. So we will wait for him. And as soon as he gets on, we will get started. Thanks everyone again for coming. I so appreciate it. If you have any questions or any issues, please email me or message me here. I'm always available to talk. Thanks.
Edo? Yes, sir. Uh, 12 o'clock. Do you want me to go ahead now? Yep. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay, good. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. So my name is Aziz Butali. I am Associate Professor um, in the Department of Oral Pathology, Radiology and Medicine at the College of Dentistry, University of Iowa. I'm also the um, a faculty at the um, University of Iowa um, Genetic Cluster, IA, which is a collection of faculty across campus that um, apply human genetics work to understand the causes of diseases and conduct basic translational research. And finally, I'm also the co-director of this um, massive open online course on topics in human genetics, which is annual summer uh, course. And I'm delighted to have you guys join us today from wherever you are in the world, on campus and across the world. And our goal is to at least share with you and to, excite, um, to get you excited on the possibilities of using human genetics knowledge to inform disease um, diagnosis, treatment, and intervention and prevention. So I'm going to start a series of six lectures. I'll be the first, and my colleagues are going to take you through the next five weeks um, until the end of this course. And we hope that you'll be able to take, off, take away something and we'll appreciate feedback and questions as you want to know more. So I'll jump right, jump right into today's um, lecture, which is um, on, just a second, uh, on gene identification and molecular genetics. So the question is how do we identify genes for diseases and traits? And what techniques do we use to identify these genes? So today we're going to learn about the strategies for gene identification. How do you determine what candidate gene is the appropriate one for the phenotype or the trait? I'm using phenotype, I'm using trait, I'm also using disease condition because it's not all the time that it, it, you're looking for the gene for a disease. You could actually be looking for a disease, uh, for the gene for a trait of interest, like height or eye color. So it's, the human genetics work allows you to do that. How do we screen for this to identify this? And finally, the types of disease causing variants, if you're actually looking for disease causing variants, how do you know that a variant is disease causing? So just to give us a recap, um, this is a refresher for so many people, but it's, I'm trying to lay the foundation for the subsequent slides so that we see how these things um, evolve. The central dogma is DNA is transcribed to RNA and RNA is translated to protein. And it is the protein that represents the, or that uh, uh, interprets the phenotype that we see. But before you get to the protein, something has happened at the DNA level. So that's what we'll talk about genes that actually carry this biological information from generations to generations, being transmitted from parents to offspring, they carry this hereditary information, the components, and this information could be the, the genes could carry information for the how tall someone is, how short someone is, the eye color could be for any trait. However, genes could also have different versions, and a version of the gene is called an allele, and this is due to variations in the nucleotide across the genome. And the nucleotides across the genome are called, are, the, are four of them, the adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. Any variation in each of these is called an allele or for that particular gene, and that's why you have different versions of a gene. And across the entire human genome, you have six billion nucleotides, three billion on each of the chromosome. And of each of these variation could contribute to a traits or diseases. The language of the genome itself is actually the genetic code that carries the instruction for making protein. And remember from the dogma, I said the protein is actually what represents the phenotype or the trait. Before it gets there, there is actually an instruction of the genome. These six billion nucleotides do not just translate into information, they come in codes. And the, these codes are in triplicates 
and, and they're called codon, and each codon codes for an amino acid. And there are different amino acids that this codon codes for. And also there's an instruction in the genome that tells it to stop coding, and that's a stop codon itself. So as much as it tells it to start with the uh, translation, it also tells it when to stop. So today we're going to learn about the strategies for gene uh, disease gene identification, the choice of candidate gene, and the screening methods. If we have time, I'm going to talk about disease causing variants. So the strategies for disease um, gene identification are several, and starts starts with linkage, which has been used um, from the late '80s. And we still use linkage, but it's one of the oldest ways of identifying a gene. I'm going to talk more about linkage. Genome-wide association study, which is a statistical approach. Linkage is also a statistical approach. All exome sequencing, copy number variations, epigenetics, all genome sequencing, reverse and forward genetics. All from linkage up onto all genome sequencing is actually under the reverse genetics. All those make up the reverse genetics. In other words, identifying variants in humans or genes in humans. And forward genetics is when you identify the genes in animals and you're trying to ask the questions, do these genes also play a role for the same phenotype in animals as in humans? And bioinformatics is also a way to screen for disease gene. However, I'm not going to talk about that today because my colleague, uh, Dr. Uh, Jake uh, Michelson is going to talk about this next lecture. So let's go on to linkage. So linkage works on the premise that two genes that are closely related, uh, located on the same chromosome are inherited together. And this is uh, counterintuitive when you think about what Mendel said that each gene is independently assorted. It is true they can be independently assorted. However, if they are located together and they are inherited together, they both code for our uh, carry information for different traits, but those traits can co-occur together. So there could be independent assortment of what each gene um, codes for in terms of traits, but those traits could be inherited together because the genes are located closely together and inherited together. So that's the premise upon which linkage was uh, designed, linkage studies. And if you go back to what do genes do, they carry traits, they lead to traits. And in the genome, you have over 20,000 genes, and it is not one gene to one phenotype. Genes can carry um, information for different traits and different phenotypes. So that's why we said the pleiotrophic effect of a gene. And you could carry the information for the um, success for um, being smart or being, you know, curious, autism and all that. But the same gene could carry information for a disease also could also be important for a trait that is physiologic, not just a disease. So just to put it in context of how these genes, when they are close to, to, together, how they can be inherited together. So during recombination, which is an event that occurs during meiosis, genetic materials are exchanged between sister chromatids. And that's, in this process, genes that are located together are often exchanged um, together and inherited together. So to bring it closely, if each of these locations is a gene, A1, B1, A2, B2, and C1, C2, and there is an exchange, because A1 is close to B1, there's a good chance that A1 is always inherited along with B1 during recombination, which is an event that occurs in different, um, during meiosis. And because of this information, you could actually map the location of a gene across the genome. Because if you know the location of A and A is inherited along with B, uh, you could infer the location of B because they're inherited together. And that could help you us to establish or develop a genetic map. And again, it is important to note that the frequency of recombination can be used to determine the, uh, the location or the gene proximity between two genes. 
for instance, if the recombination event is small, it's the likelihood that the genes are closely, are closely located is high. However, if you have large recombination events, the genes may be distant apart. And this is evident with uh, populations from originally from Africa. The haplotype blocks, were, which represent the genes that are together, are smaller. In Europeans, which is a derived population from Africans, the haplotype block, which is a collection of genes that are inherited together, is larger, which is an indication of the recombination events that may have occurred over time. So that's why we always take advantage of the fact that the appetite block in Africans are smaller because of the recombination event um, is fewer in Africans. So using this knowledge, you could map the gene for a particular trait if you know the gene for another trait that is inherited together. So I'll just put, give an example so that we can understand this um, easily. If you have a family of 100 individuals and 20 of them have hypertension and of those that have hypertension you have some of them or all of them also have red hair we know that the gene for red hair is on chromosome 16. so to look for the gene for hypertension that is co-inherited co or segregated or co-expressed in this family you could start looking for that gene from chromosome 16 for red hair because it's on the premise that since the two traits are inherited together, it is possible that the genes that express them are also in close proximity. So looking for the gene for hypertension, you start from where the gene for red air is. And the key here is phenotyping. In other words, can you clearly define the clinical representation, which is the phenotype? And accurate phenotyping is the foundation for a successful human genetics work. If you miss the phenotype, there's a good chance that you're going to miss the gene discovery. So we give, not just in linkage, but in every genetic approach, the phenotype is important. There are syndromic forms of a phenotype and there are isolated forms. You must be able to differentiate before you go on to the molecular genetics work. Otherwise, you're going to miss the discovery. So just to further use this family as an example. So if you have 20 with hypertension and red air, and you know the location for red air on chromosome 16 is likely you find the gene for hypertension on chromosome 16. However, if only 12 people have both hypertension and red air out of 20 people, maybe the gene for hypertension is on chromosome 16 and it may not be there, but that's a good place to start if you're looking for the gene for hypertension. And lastly, if only one person has red hair out of the 20 people that have got hypertension, it is not likely that the gene for red air is, is on chromosome 16. So what do you do? Fortunately, in the human genome, there are variations that we all carry, and those variations don't necessarily lead to a disease. They're just normal variations that exist on our genome, and they do not lead to any phenotype. And because we know the location of these variations, we could use them to map for disease genes or traits, if they are linked to those traits or diseases. And these genetic variations could be short sequences markers. And they are very often when you have multiple affected in a particular family. So here is an example. In this family, those that are affected are those that are shaded in black. So everybody that has a black uh, shade is affected. And this family has three generations which are multiple affected. So if you have markers and you're trying to ask the question, what Part of the genome is linked with this uh, disease in this family. You could use those short sequences and those short sequences are represented here as A1 to A4. And if you look just eyeballing this pedigree which this family structure, you could easily see that A1 is linked to those that are affected. However, this is not straightforward because it's a statistical approach. Even though A1 is linked, what is the likelihood that A1 is actually linked to the disease of, in this family? So it's a parametric or non-parametric statistical approach. And a lot score of three or more suggests that this region of the, of the genome is linked to the disease. So remember I used the word region, I didn't use the word gene because it's not, these are short sequences. They don't necessarily tell, stay, um, code for any gene. They could be around the genome, close to a gene. So 
after identifying that this A1 location of the A1 on the genome is linked to the disease, you still have to do what we call find map. Look closely what gene is within this region or close to this region that is likely the candidate gene for this disease. And that's, this approach has been used to identify so many genes in the past, and we still use them to date if you have multiple affected in families. So here's a clinical example. This is a, an individual, a family with Van der Voet syndrome. And Van der Voet syndrome is an autosomal dominant disorder. In other words, you only need one of the alleles to be affected for you to have the disease. And it has a, cl a classical uh, representation or clinical presentation, which is lower lip beat, bilateral or unilateral, could, be, could have cleft lip and palate or could have cleft lip only or cleft palate only. Using linkage, we're able to map that the region of the genome that is linked to Van der Voet is on chromosome 1Q32. So 1Q32 is linked to Van der Voet syndrome, but we don't know the gene. So to know the gene that causes Van der Voet, you need to find map or clearly sequence around this region using the old Sanger sequencing technique, which is a sequencing technique to look across a region of the genome. And you, during that, the group that identified the gene for Van der Voet screened this region and found a variant in a gene called IR6. They found this variant in um, a twin that has um, Van der Voet syndrome. And this is a monozygotic twin. They, they look alike, they, are, they share everything in common, but one of the twin has Van der Voet syndrome and the other looks normal. And so the question is, a variation in this region is likely accounting for Van der Voet in the affected twin. And that's what they found. They found variation uh, mutation in the gene called IRF6. And they now went further to screen so many other families and they found variation in IRF6 in several other families. And this was reported back in 2002. But moving on, we've also done this in different populations and up until now, we've identified over 360 variations in the gene IRF6 in families with Van der Voet syndrome, including this family from Ethiopia where the mother is affected and two daughters. And we found a mutation that is segregating. In other words, all those that are affected carry the mutation. And which suggests that this, is, um, this gene and the mutation are associated with Van der Voet in this family. So linkage, has, linkage helped to narrow the region where this gene was and we screened then found the gene for Van der Voet syndrome. So moving on to how you can identify or map a disease gene. There's what we call single nucleotide polymorphism, which is a sequence variation across the human genome. This is a change in one particular locus of the genome or the change in nucleotide from a particular nucleotide to another. And for it to be called a single nucleotide polymorphism, it must be found in over 1% of the population. And this single nucleotide polymorphism, otherwise known as SNPs, account uh, for over 90% of human genetic variation. They don't necessarily cause disease. Some of the SNPs do cause diseases, but others are just normal genetic variation in the genome. And you find them between one to 300 base pairs across the human genome. That means you have over half a million um, SNPs across the human genome. So using the knowledge of SNP, that's what was um, used to design a statistical approach called genome-wide association study. SNPs, let me backtrack a little bit. SNPs were identified when we they tried to look for common variations across uh, common variations across different populations around the world. And using the app map, that means the haplotype map. So each SNP represents an haplotype block, and haplotype blocks and group of SNPs that are inherited together. And I talked about this during recombination. So those SNPs that are inherited together, they're closely related, they're inherited together. So a SNP is actually representing that block. And this was mapped across different populations, and that's how they came up with a list of SNPs. And using the knowledge of SNP is what informed this statistical approach called genome-wide association studies, which I'm gonna talk about in the next few slides. So what is GWAS? This is an unbiased interrogation of the human genome 
to look for a SNP that is associated with a disease or trait. Here, this is a statistical um, analysis where you compare the minor allele frequency. Remember, an allele is a version of a gene. So here you're comparing the minor allele frequency. You have a major and a minor. So you're comparing the minor allele frequency between those that are affected with, uh, compared to those that are not affected. And because of the statistical analysis, so for each SNP to be considered significantly associated, for one SNP, it has to be less than or equals to 0.05. So remember I said you have about 500,000 SNP in the human genome. So it's possible you, you are conducting 500,000 tests at the same time. So to control for those multiple tests, for each SNP to be significant, you have to control for the multiple tests. So if you divide, 500,000 by, um, to divide 0 0.05 by 500,000, you're going to get terrorists for minus eight. So for any SNP across the entire human genome to be considered significantly associated with a disease or trait of interest, it has to have a p-value of terrorists for minus eight or lower. So, and this is represented in this figure here, which is called a Manhattan plot. So I'll just give you an orientation. The y-axis is the p-value, negative log of 10, and the x-axis are the chromosomes, 1 to 22. Now, each of these dots you see, these color-coded dots represent a SNP, and each color represents the chromosome. Here, these two SNPs are considered genome-wise significant when you do the comparison between cases and control, because they have a p-value that is less than or equals to times by minus 8. And when you plot those SNPs, these two SNPs separately, you can see the p-value here. This is the y-axis. So here we, we interpret this as saying that SNP 1 and 2 are significantly associated with a di disease or trait of interest. Now that doesn't necessarily tell you where the gene is, but it tells you where in the genome that, that you should look for that gene. And each of these SNPs is in a locus on the genome. That means it's in a defined location. So you can start looking for your gene from this location. And there are different ways for looking for the gene. You could do the fine mapping we talked about you could look at the genes that are adjacent to this SNP if they have biological relevance, or you could look at the healthy block, which is the linkage block, which genes are in the same haplotype block as this SNP, or you could use what we call the TAD, topological associated domain, which defines where this SNP is and the genes and promoters of the different genes. So these are different approaches, but what GWAS has helped you with here is to narrow that portion of the genome that you should start looking for your gene of interest. And this, this is just a blowout of the Manhattan plot. So this is your threshold for significance. And any SNP that is lower, lower than this threshold is considered to be genome-wise significant. So again, GWAS is an unbiased. You don't know what you're looking for. You're interrogating the entire genome, looking for that part of the genome that is associated with your disease or trait. And this, statistical approach has been used to identify common and rare variants. I use common here, but now we can use it for rare variants. Back in the day, just for rare variants. And over 20,000 risk loci have been identified and reported in almost all 22 chromosomes and for different diseases and traits. So you can see that GWAS is very popular. It's still being used till now. It started being used from the late 90s, early 2000s up until now. And it's a very powerful tool to discover because it's unbiased and it's a statistical approach and it's very stringent. And the approach could be case control or it could be case triad where you have an affected child and two parents. So both approaches are good, but the case triad is better because it avoids, uh, helps to avoid population substructure. Because if you're looking at cases and control, there are these are technically two different populations, but within the same family, it's one population. So both parents and the child, that's the best approach for GWAS. But if you don't have father, mother, and child, you could use cases and control. But either way, you still have a good discovery that is robust. So we have used GWAS in my lab to identify, um, to identify two new candidate genes for cleft palate only in the African population. And these genes have biological relevance. This is a gene, CTNNA2, that is involved in adhesion and is expressed in the penofacial region and is associated with cleft palate only. And this is another gene, which is a gene that is involved in alcohol metabolism. And like I said, genes have pleiotrophic effects. It's involved in alcohol metabolism, is expressed in the liver, but we also show that it's expressed 
in the craniofacial region. So again, this is a discovery from GWAS. And for my area of research, which is cleft lip and palate, we've identified over 50 risk loci for cleft lip and palate um, through um, about 10 GWAS studies, including a meta-analysis. So having talked about GWAS, which is a way of looking at the association between rare or common variants with a disease. There's another way strategy that is called exome sequencing. And exome sequencing, it's from the word exon, which is all the potent coding part of the genome are called exome. So in the gene, you have the exon, which is the potent coding part, and you have the intron. So if you combine all the exons together for one gene and all the 20 to 25,000 genes in the human genome, they are called exomes. So these are all potent coding. And this makes up 1% of the entire human genome. So of the 6 billion nucleotides, only about 1% codes for protein. So if you consider the human genome to be an apple, a slice of this apple is actually the protein coding region. And we now know that disease-causing mutation, 85% of them are in this protein coding region. And that makes sense because if your protein carries your trait, or it codes for a gene that could be associated with the disease, if you find a variation in that protein, it could cause instability of the protein or destruction of the protein, and then lead to a phenotype. So this makes sense that 85% of disease-causing mutations are found in the exome. And exome sequencing, all exome sequencing has been used for different disease traits, both clinical and common diseases. And the first time it was used and reported was in 2010, and it was used to identify the gene that was responsible or that is responsible for Miller syndrome. And ever since, it's been used for different um, clinical conditions and traits. The first clinical use of all exome sequencing was used in the diagnosis and treatment of a child with chronic inflammatory bowel disease. I'm going to talk more about this in the next slide because this is interesting. And this is the, where clinicians and basic scientists should, be consider, should consider working together because this is how you can actually apply human genetics for the good of humans as well as treatment of diseases. And it's also being used for common diseases and traits like axima, cleft lip and palate, and autism. So this is the paper that first reported the clinical use of all exome sequencing. And in that study, it's the child presented with different clinical conditions that are consistent with Crohn's disease. And the clinicians were unable to make a definitive diagnosis. And without a definitive diagnosis, they couldn't plan the treatment for this child. So they resulted in the use of exome sequencing to The question was, can we identify variants in a gene that makes biological sense that we can then track back to the clinical phenotype? And that's what they did. They did all exome sequencing, identified a variant, a missense variant, and the gene where this variant was found. And this gene made sense. And the clinical, they then added this, the genes, the uh, biological information for this gene, added it to the medical history of this child, as well as functional data that was available. And they came up with the diagnosis and the treatment plan. And the treatment was allogenic hematopoietic uh, progenitor cell transplant. And this child is doing well, very well since this transplant was done, because that's the treatment that is recommended for the um, diagnosis, which is S-linked inhibitor of apoptosis deficiency. So the, the bottom line here is, for this is an un, undiagnosed disease from the clinical standpoint, but diagnosis was done using exome sequencing and that informed treatment. And from this, from 2011, now we now have the um, exome sequencing of undiagnosed diseases and so many diseases have been diagnosed using exome sequencing. And this is a, a very um, important area of both clinical and basic translational research. So, and this is a message to the clinician in the room. You could actually employ exome sequencing when you have, you have difficulty making your clinical diagnosis. So we've also used that for cleftin, which is um, a complex trait. And we did exome sequencing, the multi, uh, multiplex family where they have several people affected with cleft palate only. We did exome sequencing for five of them. We found the variant that's it's carried by everybody that is affected, which suggests that it's Mendelian and, and sort of somatosomal dominant. We did Sanger sequencing of 
for this variant on those that we didn't send for exome sequencing and we showed that all these other ones carry the same variant. And this is the first time we were showing that this gene called AGAP has a variant that segregates in cleft palate only. AGAP29 was previously reported for non syndromic cleft lip and palate, but exome sequencing allowed us to show that it's also um, associated with cleft palate only. So this is a clinical um, research use of exome sequencing to identify the, the gene for a, um, a disease. And a recent study also used it to identify more genes for non-syndromic cleft lip and palate. So moving on from exome to copy number variations. And copy number variations are either deletions of large segments of the genome or amplification of large segments of the genome. And this happens when there is non-allelic homologous recombination. And we talked about recombination, that's allelic homologous recombination. So there could be non-allelic, and this could be due to non-alignment of the two chromosomes during recombination. And this usually happens when there is damage and repair of the, um, the DNA. And this has been reported a lot in cancers. So when you have the non-allelic homologous recombination, you could have an extra component of a region of a genome, which is called amplification, or you could have a deletion of a segment of the genome, which is called um, the, uh, deletion. So that like, segmental deletion of the, this part of the genome. And in research, as well as clinical um, approaches, the different techniques used to identify this. And one of the techniques used to identify um, deletion of large segments of the human genome used to be the fluorescent in situ um, hybridization, which is called FISH. And that's looking for regions of um, the chromosome that is deleted or amplified. But that's FISH is just for one segment of the human genome. Now we could do the same fish for across the entire genome, and that is called array-based comparative genomic hybridization, where you could use DNA probes that you would have used for, for fish to interrogate the entire genome to look for large deletions or amplification. And using that, we've been able to identify large deletions in individuals with cleft lip and palate that took away two genes, and one of these genes was shown to be a cleft candidate gene. And in another individual with cleft palate, we also showed a small deletion that took away the promoter region of this gene. So suggesting that this gene, if, if it is perturbed, or in other words, if it is deleted, or if part of it is deleted, it could lead to a cleft lip and palate. And this is just to show the animal work that confirmed that. So this is Xenopus, the, um, the frog, and this is showing the expression of the gene in normal when it's not perturbed. But when you delete this gene, the face is messed up, which confirmed that this gene itself plays a role in craniofacial development. And this was identified using um, array-based genome capitalization, which is also known as the copy number variation approach for gene identification. My group has also used genome, gene, GWAS data so we did GWAS for African data, and we have the genotype. So we also did the analysis of the genotype, looking at the intensity of the SNPs across the genome. And we're able to show in a family that a child has what is called a de novo deletion of a segment of chromosome 18. And both parents are normal around this region. They, don't, they have normal, um, genome, the genomic region is, looks normal. But in this child, there's a large deletion. And we call it de novo because it was not inherited from both parents. It's a new event, it's of new. So that's why it's called de novo, and this is a deletion. But we use GWAS data, while the other study used the um, AC, RACGH. Both approaches are used to identify genes or genomic regions that are associated with diseases or traits. And deletions and amplifications have been reported, especially for cancer to be the underlying mechanism for cancer. So I'll move quickly to epigenetics and just briefly talk, touch on this. And epigenetic um, changes are not sequence variations. This the sequence, DNA sequence is normal. However, there is a change in the gene expression. And this could be physiologic, where some genes are expressed at different time points during development. And it could also be pathologic where 
when you express this gene to be expressed, it is silent, it is inactive. And this is because in different part of the genome, that's what we call methylation and that's what we call histone modification. Methylation, DNA methylation, which affects the expression of a gene is often found where there's a methyl group attached to a cytosine next to a guanine. So there is another what is called a CPG island. And these are across the human genome and usually found close to the promoter of a gene. And the role of this methylation is to silence the gene at different time points in normal development. However, in disease process, it silences the gene or affects the gene expression when the gene is supposed to be active. And epigenetics has been used to identify genes in the genome that are differentially methylated. And this has been assigned to a, a disease or a trait. So DNA methylation is one process where um, the gen genetic markers to identify epigenetic changes and histone modification. And this has been used severely. These methyl groups could be added as a result of environmental exposure, like smoking. It could be age-related. It could also be due to diet, farming. These are all been associated with epigenetic changes in the human genome, not DNA sequence. The DNA sequence appears to be normal, but the gene is not expressed at the level it should be because of epigenetic changes. And in Clefton, there are five uh, epigenetic changes that have been um, studies that have been conducted and we compared in cases and controls and we found areas that are differentially methylated in cases versus control. Remember I said it is age could affect it, so it's time dependent. The expression of the gene is different at different time points. And also it depends on the genetic material that you're looking at. The genetic, epigenetic changes in blood is different from saliva, it's different from tissues as well. So when you're carrying a study of this nature, the question you should ask yourself is, what is the, the epigenetic expression in this tissue of interest? Before you even go down to looking at the genes that are differentially expressed. And it is also important that smoking, the gen epigenetic signature for smoking has been well documented. So you could look at what is available for smoking and use that, those markers when you're looking for epigenetic changes related to smoking for your own disease of interest. And finally, talk about old genome sequencing. Old genome sequencing is now our ability to interrogate, the, to sequence the entire human genome. So both the coding and the non-coding region. So in this old genome sequencing data set, you have the SNPs, the polymorphisms, you have variation in the coding region. So if you're gonna do exome sequencing, you can pull up only the coding region from this whole genome sequencing. If you want to do a GWAS, you pull up the SNPs from this sequencing. If you want to look at copy number variation, you can also pull that data from here, even epigenetic changes. So whole genome sequencing is, is as a result of our ability to use technology and science at the same time to sequence the entire human genome. It used to be very expensive, about $10,000 per, per human genome, but now it's as cheap as less than $1,000, which is about the same price as the other technology. So most studies done now use whole genome sequencing, then they can do the analysis for the subtypes to identify genes or genomic regions of interest. So very important and powerful tool as well. So in addition to what I've talked about, everything I've talked about is reverse genetics. I also want to share the role of multi-ethnic groups in human genetic studies for gene discovery. And I'm going to use these two figures. This figure A is GWAS that was done in Europeans, and they identified a significant region on chromosome 8. But if you look at GWAS for Asians, that signal was absent. And this is because this, 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 for this SNP, the manual leaf frequency was 35 to 37 percent in some Europeans, and Asians it was less than 2 percent. So it was not informative. So you couldn't detect a significant um, association for this SNP in the Asian population. So if you're looking at only Asians for your study, you would have missed this discovery. Vice versa, there's a significant association here for Asians in, on chromosome one that is absent in the European population. So looking at only a European population, you'd have missed this discovery from the Asian population. 
So therefore, if you combine both population in your GWAS or in any um, study, there's a good chance that you discover the signals for in chromosome one and chromosome 18. So this is a very interesting study. I would, I would like to share this. So this is the first GWAS for diabetes in Africa. And in this GWAS, they were able to identify an African specific loci, uh, locus around this gene here, ZRNAB3. In this study, all type 2 diabetes GWASs have reported this loci. This is the most reported GWAS loci, uh, locus for type 2 diabetes. But the first African GWAS identified a new locus. And this locus was shown to play a role in glucose hemostasis. So there's a biological relevance because type 2 diabetes and glucose hemostasis. So there's biological relevance. And they're able to show this in using an animal model in zebrafish. I'm not going to go through all the different processes. You ought to do. Just let you know that this is the largest GWAS for an African population for type 2 diabetes. And this led to a discovery. So to recap, uh, reverse and forward genetics. So we, everything I've talked about from linkage to whole genome sequencing is reverse genetics. In other words, identifying the genes or variants in humans, then moving on to animals. So I'm just going to talk a bit about so how we apply the reverse genetics. If we, if we find a gene in humans, the question is, is this gene expressed in relevant tissues? So this is the expression in animals, in the, my, uh, in the mouse. This is in situ hybridization showing that the gene that we're talking about here, AGAP29, is expressed in relevant beneficial tissues, both in the in situ, um, the H and E stain, as well as the immunofluorescent stain. So all together, you can show that your gene is expressed in the tissues of interest. So that's how you take it from humans to the animals. Now you could identify genes in animals, then ask if the same gene is responsible for same phenotype in animal in humans and this is called forward genetics so here you are screening for a gene in animals then you ask if it's relevant to humans so this is a study that was done in zebrafish where they are trying to look for co-binding site for ir6 so which genes bind on the same site site across the genome as ir6 remember i told you that only one percent or one to two percent of genome codes for the protein the other 98 to 99%, they code for something. Those are called regulatory regions across the human genome. And those regulatory regions affect genes as well. So by doing this, um, this group here in Iowa, we're able to show that the gene ZNF750 co-binds with IRF6. And this is the region of, of the genome where they co-bind. And this region is called the hand answer. Now, but this does not tell the complete story. The next question is, they were able to show that this enhancer interacts with the promoter of this gene called ZNF750. So what is the role of ZNF750? They're trying to understand this. So working with my group, we're able to show that variation in ZNF750 is associated with cleft palate only. So we've moved from animals to humans. And this is, an, this is all unpublished work. We've not published this, but I'm just trying to show you how you can go from identifying a gene in animals and then validating that in humans. This is forward genetics. So the choice of your candidate gene when you are trying to identify a candidate gene depends on the biological properties of the gene. Is it of relevance to the disease of interest? And how where is it expressed? Expression profile of that gene is extremely important. Those are two major considerations. And how do you then screen to confirm? You can screen by looking for mutations in those genes using Sanger. You can also do your reverse, which is all the technique I showed you, reverse genetics, and forward genetics, which is in animals, then you go back to humans. So choice of candidate genes and the screening method will help you identify genes of interest. Um, I will do it for time, so I can leave if I should um, to decide if I should. Okay, we've got a few more minutes, yeah. So what are the types of disease causing uh, variants? So, you know, we talked about SNPs. So those SNPs could also, from the nucleotide change could lead to an amino acid change from a particular amino acid to another. That's called a missense mutation, or it's called a non-synonymous mutation. That means there's a change in the amino acid. And based on the prediction of these variants using bioinformatic tools, you could 
predict if it was um, damaging to the protein deleterious or if it was tolerated by the protein. And this is based on bioinformatics tools that are conservative. They might not necessarily tell you the biology, so it could be conservative. But these are missense mutations. You could also have what is called a nonsense mutation, which causes a premature stop codon. It's supposed to be transcribed until it gets to where it should naturally stop based on the information, the uh, genetic code. However, that premature, uh, that stop codon could come before the exact location on the genome, and, uh, on the protein, and that's called premature stop codon or stop codon. And that's a nonsense mutation. And you could have what is called a synonymous mutation, which is the same amino acid is coded for even though there is a nucleotide change. And some people call this silent mutation. But sometimes silent mutation could be functional where they affect splicing. And I'm going to talk about splicing a bit. So splicing is an event where you take off the intron, which is not the protein coding part of the, of the gene, and which allows the exons to come together. So if you have a mutation in the intron exon uh, junction, which is the splice location, it could affect splicing because splicing allows you to take off the intron so that the exons come together. So if there's a silent mutation or any mutation, even if it's, in, um, if it's nonsense or it could be intronic mutation, but it's in the splice junction, it could affect splicing. And that will lead to a very unstable protein and then affect the phenotype or the trait. Sometimes you could have what is called an exon skip because of you have um, a splice site mutation and this exon is skipped and you have only exon one and three coming together. Again, this protein is not going to be stable. And these are also disease-causing mutations. You could also have just an insertion of one nucleotide, one additional nucleotide to your sequence, and that could lead to what is called a frame shift. And this could then lead to a premature stop as well. Or you could have a deletion of a nucleotide, and this could also lead to a frame shift that causes a stop um, codon as well. So this could also lead to premature stop. So this insertion of one or two nucleotide or deletion of one or two nucleotide could lead to, um, these, these are also disease causing because they lead to frame shifts then affect the function, stability of the protein. So um, in the next one minute, I'm just going to recap that take home from this uh, talk today is um, in discovery, you can use several methods, um, which begins with linkage. And linkage is most effective when you have multiple affected in a family. And our knowledge of linkage then informed GWAS. Linkage allows you to do a few markers at the same time. However, GWAS, you can look at, look at the entire human genome to look for regions, the states that are associated with a disease or a trait. And GWAS is still being used till today because it's a powerful tool, unbiased way of interrogating the human genome. Exome sequencing, I talked about that, which is just looking at the protein coding region of the human genome. And the protein coding region of the human genome is about 1% of the entire genome. However, because it codes for protein and these proteins represent the phenotype, any variation in that protein could lead to a disease. So it's important. And 85% of disease causing mutations have been found in the exome. I also talk about copy number variations where you have large deletions of a segment of the genome or you have an amplification of a segment of the genome. And this could happen following DNA um, damage and repair. And if a segment of the genome is deleted, genes within that region are gonna be affected because they, they, they won't be expressed anymore because they've been deleted and that could lead to disease. And those genes within those regions could be the genes that are contribute to your phenotype or your disease or your trait. I also talked about epigenetics, which is heritable changes in the genome without DNA variation in DNA sequence. DNA sequence looks the same, but there is gene expression differences, or there are gene expression differences. So differential methylation or histone modification of the genome, which leads to gene silencing or inactive gene, gene, inact uh, gene inactivation, or the genes are also active when those methylation um, markers or epigenetic markers are not in play. And I also talked about the fact that epigenetics could be physiologic where it's 
genes are expressed at different time points in development, which is normal because some genes are active in some at some time points and they are inactive, which is physiologic and during development. And in a normal process where it should be active and the gene is inactive, it could be due to differential ventilation and environmental factors like smoking, diet could contribute to differential ventilation or expression of a gene. That's epigenetics. And finally, whole genome sequencing, which is now our ability to sequence the entire human genome, allows you to see every nucleotide in the genome, all 6 billion nucleotides, and you could extract nucleotides that code for protein, which is the exome region of the genome. You could look at copy number variations, you could look at epigenetic changes, the metal um, that is attached to the cytosine next to a guanine, the CPG islands that are very close to promoters of a gene. So you could get all this information in whole genome sequencing. And that's a powerful tool. And our ability to do this is very encouraging because it gives you more information that allows you to carry out different analysis to identify genes of interest. And finally, the choice of that candidate gene that you are trying to identify depends on the biological role that of the genes you see after you identify after your study. It depends on the gene expression profile of that particular gene. And if you have access to working with developmental biologists, the functional role of that gene, just like in the diabetic study that we, they were able to show in zebrafish that the new gene for diabetes that was discovered plays a role in glucose homeostasis is very important. So if you're able to do this, this helps to validate your choice of candidate gene. So with that, I'll be happy to take questions in the next five minutes of um, this talk. Thank you. Ada, do, you have quest do we have questions on the chat box or something? I don't see any just yet. Um, would you mind giving everybody a minute and seeing if they would submit? If, if you have a question, now would be the time to submit. If you're shy and don't want to, feel free to um, email me and I'm more than happy to pass them along to Dr. Gutali. And I'll respond, um, send you answers back to you, Ada, for the um, participants and other participants to benefit from as well. Yes. Um, we've got one from Abigail, a question. It says, does this only apply to inherited diseases? So, not only to inherited diseases, it's cool. That's what we always call them, um, like I talked about, um, sp that could be sporadic events where both parents may not have this disease and the child has the disease, so all it's called. So, that, that could be what's called, inherited is familiar, that could be sporadic where is a new event in the family and that could be that's what we call the post zygomatic event or and usually they are the mutations are called de novo mutations of new that is, it's not inherited it must have happened after the gametes are uh, the um the um, spermatozoa and the eggs have been fertilized so post zygomatic events yes you could have isolated cases where you then need to identify the gene that has led to this new event in the family. So it doesn't have to be inherited. Okay, we've got another one here. Uh, which of the tools will you consider the most powerful yet less expensive, especially considering conducting research with a low budget? So um, again, what's your research question? So you start with what is known about the disease of interest. If you already know the gene based on previous studies, so the easiest thing you do is to screen that gene that has been known for variants in your own cohort. If you have a low budget and there is nothing known about your gene and you're putting a, a few families together, you could do linkage if you have more than one affected in the families. And otherwise, what you could also do is um, like GWAS is becoming cheaper if you have a large sample size. You could do GWAS for about 200 US dollars now per sample, and it used to be about a thousand. So all these are coming down. But another way to do all these studies is to learn to collaborate. In other words, if you have a phenotype and you have the cohorts, can you link up with others around the world to pull cohorts together? 
and one of your collaborators could have access to funds where he can do these studies together. So you don't have to be the lone hunter in the forest anymore for you to do, uh, carry out good genetic studies. Collaboration is key to discovery as well. And that's why the multi-ethnic approach comes in. It allows for collaboration. I hope I've answered the question, but that's the best way to do it. If you have no budget and you have access to samples, you can then collaborate with others. Okay, you have time for one more, you said? I think so. Um, I think it's about 55. No. Okay. Um, it says, Dr. Butali talked majorly about Sanger sequencing. Is exome sequencing possible with Sangers? Exome sequencing is not possible with Sangers. So exome, you're looking at the entire human genome. You're talking about sequencing 6 billion nucleotides at the same time. With Sanger, the most you can sequence is 900 and 50 base pairs, and that will give you the best result. Anything below, beyond that, you start having sequence information that, you, that are not clear and that um, you can't even decipher what they are. So Sanger is best for very short regions of the genome at different times. And if you do Sanger for different with part of the genome and you want to cover the entire genome, it's more expensive. Because each time you carry out a Sanger sequence, for each sample is $2.50. You can imagine doing each region for $2.50 of 900, you do the math, you'll be spending close to 10,000 per individual entire genome using Sanger. But well, all genome sequencing is cheaper now, $1,000, you're gonna do the entire human genome. So Sanger is better when you want to look at a small region of the genome, less than 1,000 base pairs, to, clean, to clearly find map. However, Sanger is better than all genome sequencing when it comes to getting accurate re results of a small region of the human genome. So we use Sanger to validate um, all the other omics studies like whole genome and um, whole exome. So um, I hope that answers the question I see. So Sanger is good, but it's not for entire human genome. It's gonna to be too expensive and, expensive and tedious. Okay, that sounds good. Um, why don't we go ahead and wrap it up then. Um, thank everyone for coming. Uh, Richard, along with, uh, everybody else here. Thanks everyone for attending. It was a good talk. And I'll be sending out an email with a survey and a link to the video and audio. And if you have any questions or need any follow-up, please feel free to email me at any time. And thank you, Dr. Batali. That was awesome. Well, thank you very much, Eva, for hosting this and for doing all the admin work. And thanks to everyone for attending. We hope uh, this has been interesting. And we'll see you guys next week and the subsequent weeks um, so that we can have uh, good reasons to continue yep. going out. Yep, we'll be here next week with uh, Dr. Jake Michelson. So we'll see you then. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.